John here. Let's get the VDP program moving here. What I want to do is go over the program that I wrote that downloads configuration that draws this picture right here. The bottom here we'll find out is not looking the way it's supposed to. And if we zoom way in, we'll see some weird color artifacts and stuff up here that I kind of did on purpose. So we can sort of see what is going on so we don't get disoriented when we exceed the limitations of NTSC video. I talked a little bit about NTSC video and the limitations of how to deal with the color and how the color can be out of whack if you're not careful about what you put on the screen and you, when you're generating uh, uh, pixels that are too small that can confuse the, uh, the chroma carrier. All right, so that and that is why this down here looks the way it does. This is actually black and white vertical stripes, in spite of the fact that they look all different colored. And we'll see why that is and how uh, that got configured in the VRAM, and how you can uh, try to avoid doing that when you don't want to uh, by accident. Okay. All right, so here's the stuff we're going to use today. I just updated the GitHub page for the VDP retro board. And I added these links to the manuals. I apologize, I'm sure I meant to do this earlier. We've got the 1982 manual, the 1984, and a data sheet that has some uh, the detailed timing in it. You've seen all these before on videos where I talk about the VDP. I just didn't, for whatever reason, yet have the links to them uploaded on the VDP GitHub site, all right, which is John Wines, last 2068, blah, 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 blah. See the links below uh, the, in the description of the video on YouTube. So today I'm going to be playing around with this m1t1.asm file, which is on uh, in with all the other software for the, for the CPM uh, OS release for the retro board, all right? So I'm looking at CPM slash file system slash program slash TMS 9118. In that directory are a whole bunch of assembly language uh, files. Some of these uh, we've looked at already. When we're playing around testing the mode one graphics and the DRAM and stuff like that, okay? Today I'm looking at mode one test one dot ASM. Now, what we're going to accomplish here is pretty simple, but it's going to require a lot of uh, kind of background and get the general gist of kind of what's going on with the VDP here. So let's uh, kind of, I'm going to have to kind of come at this from two or three different angles, all kind of at the same time. The standard setup for a COM file on CPM started at address 100. It set up a custom local stack, which means when we're done, we have to warm boot. Although we're not really doing much, clearly I could have just left this out and done a return down here. It would have gone back faster. But with our awesome cache support in the BIOS, this is really no big deal. Uh, and it gives us growing room, which is what we're going to need. As we work towards trying to write our first video game, which I hope I will uh, be able to do a breakout game at some point. So this is the whole program. Set up a stack load some parameters into a register, and do an otter instruction. We're going to use this to configure the seven registers that hold the configuration settings for the VDP. Then we're going to do something very similar again down here. And this is a loop that I've written that downloads bytes one at a time into the video RAM using the basically the, all the commands we talked about before when we were testing the DRAMs, you know, in the Rev0 and the, run, and the Rev1 uh, VDP checkout code. But if you recall, when we did those tests, I ran the input and the output instructions by hand in DDT with all the printing and debugging going. So it ran incredibly slow. And this is like the, the number one thing you got to get right with the with the 9118, the 99XX VDP family. You can only write at them so fast and at certain times, depending on what the thing is doing. All right. So it turns out when you first bring the thing online, we can write at full Z80 speed at 10 megahertz using an otter instruction to send down the config data to set up the registers. Because if you count the cycles when you're doing an otter instruction, it takes uh, on the order of 
two microseconds per iteration, which is the speed limit when talking to the VDP registers. And I've tested it. It works fine. Okay. So we're going to use that when we're writing to the registers, but we're going to use this other routine, which is a lot like an outer instruction, but it's written out longhand so that it writes a byte, waits a little while, writes the next byte, and so on. So the way this thing works is we're going to copy bytes one at a time from the VRAM init symbol below. We'll have a, we'll take plenty of time to look at what's in there, okay? That's part of this file. And then we're going to copy it into the uh, video RAM. Uh, uh, this many bytes we're going to copy into the video RAM, and it's going to go into the video RAM at address 0. And I have no idea why I have this comment over here that is irrelevant. I must have copied this line of code from somewhere else. Let's update that. So the VDP address of the uh, uh, VRAM is zero. Okay, so the point here is that this address is in the memory space and the numbering that's used by the Z80. So this is the Z80 address. This one down here is the address where in the VDP sees the data. This is the VDP's target address in the video RAM, okay? So when the video RAM is filled in, it starts at what the VDP thinks is address number zero. And that's what goes in the DE register here. That's the VRAM address on the VDP board. This is the Z80's address in the main system memory. And this is how many bytes we're going to send over in that subroutine right there, okay? Let's look at, look at this for a minute. Where did I come up with this 8 microseconds? How come we're writing it slow? How do I know where all this comes from, right? Well, that brings us back to the GitHub page for this project. Oops, in these manuals. The 1982 manual has a table in it that tells you about these speeds. We'll look at that in a minute. The 1984 manual is the one that I've been using a lot. This is the one that has the correct pinout for the 9118. The 9118 was released after the 9918. This is the original manual up here. This has more information in it about timing. For whatever reason, it doesn't show up in the 1984 manual. Down here is a data sheet that has detailed timing of the 9118, and I put a note in here, sorry, I couldn't find a copy of it anywhere else while looking around today. This link goes to uh, one of these websites that I try not to use <laughs> unless I have to because it's littered with tons of ads, all right? So in this video, we're going to be looking at these two manuals right here. This is the older 9918 manual, and this is the newer 9118 manual, right? both of which are about 40 years old. Okay, it's a retro project. All right, so here's the older manual. This is the 1982 manual for the 9918. Now, if we scroll down to page 13 in the PDF, section 2.1.5, it talks about uh, there's a heading that doesn't really make sense once you read this. It says reading from the VRAM. This discusses reading and writing, <laughs> okay, Be between the the host CPU and the VDP uh, controlled VRAM, all right? It talks about what the VDP does over the course of time and how long it takes it to do various things when it's in graphics mode one and graphics mode two and text mode and all this other fun stuff. And then it comes down to this table down here, which is the essence of what we really need to concern ourselves with right now. And uh, if you read this stuff above, it, it explains what this total time column is here. And these are all um, the situation under which the VDP is, uh, you know, operating. Sometimes it's drawing what we call the active display area, and that's when we're actually writing the part that you think of as the as the actual data on the screen. And this up here and around the sides are the mm, horizontal, is the horizontal, you know, area 
uh, during uh, which it's not in the active display region. And then when you go from the bottom down here, and it's doing a vertical retrace back up to here, that's the the vertical interrupt signal stuff that they're talking about over here, all right? So depending on what is drawing on the screen in any given time, it can take anywhere from two microseconds to eight microseconds where it will delay processing the request from the CPU. So as long as you never exceed this eight microseconds for your, you know, your throttling rate, if you only write one byte every eight microseconds, this will guarantee that the VDP will be able to handle it and it won't lose any of them. All right, if you exceed this and the VDP is currently drawing in this area, it'll throw those bytes away and you'll fail to configure the, the memory and you'll end up with a messed up screen or some bad settings or something like that. So our goal is to write no faster than one byte every mi eight microseconds. And that is the goal of the right slow routine, right? So what are we doing here, right? Uh, the, the, uh, the note here, the summary right here, the VDP can require up to eight microseconds per VRAM right in the graphics modes one and two and yada, yada, yada. This will run slow enough to make sure that that's going to happen. Now, I timed this and wrote it to run on my 10 megahertz Z80. If your Z80 runs at a different speed, you have to adjust this accordingly, all right? Uh, if your Z80 runs any slower than mine does, you can still use this. It'll just waste time. You could rewrite this and speed it up a little in your case if that is the situation. And as I write, the DE is the destination target in the VDP address space. HL is the memory uh, that I'm going to copy into the video DRAM from the host in the Z80's address space. And BC is the number of bytes that I'm going to send. So what I'm going to do here, we saw this before. When we're writing data into the DRAM, we put the address in, we do the least significant byte first, then we do the most significant byte, and when we do the most significant byte, we have to set this bit and blah, blah, blah. We talked about all this before. And if you forgot how this works, go back and read the, um, the sections in the manual where we just were looking at how you read and write to the VRAM, and it'll remind you how this stuff works. Now, I need to copy... The, the value, the contents from the BC register into the DE register here, and this is how I decided to do that, because I no longer need the DE value. The only reason I pass it in is so that I can write it in here to let the VDP know what address in the DRAM I want to send my stuff to. So I copy it into DE, and the reason I do that is because I'm going to use an Audi instruction, and this thing clobbers B, and it requires me to use C for something else. So I'm going to use DE as the byte count when I'm in my slow loop down here. So how does this thing work? Out I takes the value in the host memory, in the Z80 memory, at the address that's at the HL register pair, and that's why I chose to use the HL to hold the address of the host memory. That's your source buffer you want to copy out. It takes a byte out of memory there. It writes it to the output port. It does an out operation to the port given in the C register. Okay, so that's going to be able to write it to the, the VDP because that's why I put it in the VRAM address. We talked about that before when we were debugging and testing our, our, our DRAM chips. It, it'll write that out. When it's done writing that out, it'll increment the HL register. And this instruction is designed to go kind of like the out, the outer instruction that we saw earlier. And this actually messes around with the B register, although we don't care. We're not going to use that for anything. But FYI, don't expect the B register to be uh, retained because it'll actually decrement it while it goes. When we're done with that, we have to waste some time so that we don't exceed this speed limit here. So I'm going to just push and pop and push and pop because this is a relatively expensive operation and roughly it wastes about the right time. When we get down here, we need to count the number of bytes that we're sending using the DE register. So I decrement it. I asked that it become zero. If it's not zero, I go back up 
to the slow loop, and I do it again and again and again until I've sent out the number of bytes in the DE register pair, go back to the caller. So this was designed to run at roughly just over eight microseconds per iteration. And that's exactly what we want when we're downloading data into the DRAM, okay? That runs about as fast as it can without exceeding our speed limit. Now, I'm used to the 1984 manual, and for whatever reason, this is scanned in differently, and it scrolls better with my PDF browser. So I'm going to go back to this one. And the, you remember this one, it looks like this. This is the so-called programmer's guide. This is the 1984 link right there from the GitHub page, all right? And what do we need to do out of here? All right, now, this manual describes a lot of stuff. Uh, we've seen the color table here before. These are 4-bit values for what it means to be black or blue or green or white. It's F and so on. And we're going to use these uh, when we're trying to tell it what colors we want to put on the screen. For example, these white uh, rectangles are obviously set using the color F for their foreground, right? And it uses the color 1 for the background, which is black. So you got white and black and white and black in here. Same with these up here. We've got, you know, dark blue and light blue, and this is actually supposed to be red, even though it looks a little bit orange on my screen. This may be um, the, the bad um, uh, capture device that I have, or maybe we still have to play some games with the DC restoration that I was talking about before. Uh, it's not entirely obvious. We'll probably play around with that at some point down the road, uh, especially when we get back to tinkering around with asking ourselves if we can write programs that will run on the Naboo, which has got roughly all the same hardware. Because my Naboo has too much voltage coming out of it, out of the video port, and it, does, and it looks even worse. So I suspect there's going to be some tinkering with the output circuitry eventually. That might help this uh, the distortion on some of the edges of these colors a little bit. I'm just saying. But none of that will affect our ability to write programs and recognize that it works. And it's doing things. We talked about this before when we were trying to use these uh, commands to write into the video RAM. We're testing our board. I'm not going to go over that again. Um, this was in that discussion as well, how to write and how to read the various uh, registers and the DRAM, all this fun stuff, okay? So we're going to take advantage of what we discussed before. We are going to choose graphics mode 1, so we need to set uh, M1, 2, and 3 to 0, so this bit will be 0. We're not going to um, uh, use the external video here, so we're going to disable the um, the external plane. Uh, we talked about this one before. We are using a 9118, so this is one of the things that differs with the newer chip. The newer chip only supports, as we saw before, 16K. So no matter what you put in here, it will it has to be 16K. But we should go ahead and put a 1 in there anyway, so that we'll be compatible with a 9918 if we want to run this on the, uh, say, for example, the Nebu. Um, a blank screen. This is the thing we discovered before while doing some testing. We need to shut this off so that we can actually see the display. I'm going to turn on the interrupts because when we take some traces uh, on the oscilloscope, it's nice to be able to see where we are according to the VDP. I can use that to trigger my scope. In other words, that thing becomes active after it draws the bottom line of the active display when it gets down here. And it does that specifically so that I can come in here, and we'll deal with this when we do the, when we're playing around with sprites and joysticks and all that. I started working on a nice little program. I can show you what we've got going on there. But it only works if you synchronize it just right, and you take advantage of the fact that for 4,300 microseconds, Right after that interrupt signal goes on, you can write at a fast rate of one byte every two micros. So that's four times faster, and then some, of our slow loop code that I just looked at, okay? 
If you don't wait until here, you can't write at the full speed, number one. And number two, if you're writing onto the display, while it's being rendered, it can actually, we, it's called tearing. You can end up starting to draw a part of a picture and then finish drawing a different one if the CPU updates it while it's going. And it looks terrible. So we need to deal with this synchronization in order to get the optimized speed. That'll be a whole nother discussion in its own right, maybe next time, okay? But my point is, let's get ourselves set up. If we turn on interrupts, we leave the jumper out of the VDP board so the Z80 doesn't have to worry about them. We can look at this pin and get an insight as to what's going on on our board. That's all I'm saying. M1 and M2 are both zeros because we want graphics mode one. We write a zero in there because it says so. Uh, we're not going to play around with sprites, so these don't really matter. So I'll probably put zeros in there and say no magnification. And, you know, we're in 8 by 8 mode or whatever. Now we've got all these registers that we're supposed to set to various values. And when you write in a register to the, what is it? The least significant four bits are used in this manner to represent an address where the VDP will look for something that's called its name table. This register three, you can put set these various bits that represents an address when combined with like this, with these bits. Remember, this is the least significant bit over here. That's the most significant one there. Uh, you use this to specify where this so-called color table will be located. Then you've got another one that says this is where the pattern table is. Another one that says this is where the sprite attribute table is and where the sprite pattern table is and so on. And you'll notice that when we give it these addresses, there are only partial bits every one of these has something followed by all zeros something followed by all zeros something followed by all zeros okay and because of this i have some control over what memory is going to be used for what purpose but this forces an alignment these are you want two and a half hex digits worth of zeros over here so this has to be on a boundary and aligned is my point, such that all these bits have to be zero for the first byte of whatever table is represented by this address in register two, which is the so-called name table. This is true about all these tables. Now, if you look at what's going on here and you read this and you spend tons of time trying to figure it all out, the bottom line is we honestly don't care one bit about what's where. I mean, we sort of do. It can become issues when you're doing certain types of optimizations. Yes, I agree. Let me know in the comments below your favorite layout of where everything should go in the, uh, in the video RAM is and why. Because we'll probably run into situations where the order will matter, but it will only matter, in my opinion, when it comes to certain kinds of optimizations. Bottom line is, there's two reasons why this is reprogrammable. If you use some of the features of the chip, but not all of them, and you have an older chip that only, uh, where's that note about the memory sizes? It's right here. And you only have like 4K of RAM, then what happens is you need to be very careful about where everything is located in that video RAM because there's not enough room for everything. By making it programmable, you can choose what stuff is going to be mapped into the DRAM and what stuff you're not going to use. And back 45, you know, whatever, 40 some years ago, that would have been a big deal because this would have been a huge cost savings if you only needed to use you know, text and you didn't need sprites, for example, or something like that. And what you would do is you'd map the, the, you'd map the tables that you want into the 4K that you have, and you map the other tables into an area that doesn't even exist and there's no memory there for it, okay? On the other hand, if you have 16K, there's more than enough memory for everything that could ever be and you can store it wherever you want. And that's what I'm going to do. So let's not get totally caught up in all the opportunities and blah, 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 blah. If you go down here, eventually it talks about 
look, if you're going to be in graphics mode one and you initialize it like this, what you will have done is store the various tables in various places at these addresses, okay, in the video RAM from the perspective of the VDP. And this is the modes that I'm decided to use. Just arbitrarily said, I don't care, just use whatever their examples use. And one of the benefits of this is that all my addresses match the, the, those addresses that are documented in this guide. Now, why would you do it any other way if you can fit everything in there and no one cares about the order? Well, later on we'll see that what we need to do if you want to have an you know an animated graphic display, if you want to scroll your text, for example, even if it's that simple, you need to be able to update all the data that's on the screen. The data that represents the stuff that's on the screen are in these tables. It turns out that you don't always need to update everything in every one of these tables. In fact, you hardly ever do, and every one of these tables need to update it, that is, just to move around something on the screen. And there's a certain benefit, slight, I would argue, in reducing overhead if you happen to have two tables that are right next to each other, like this one here, the address, you know, the pattern table here that starts at head address hex 800, which comes right before this sprite attribute table, which starts at hex 1000. If you need a lot, uh, do a lot of updates to both of these tables all the time, it's nice to be able to have them right next to each other like this, because you can do one operation and write all the data into memory starting at 800 and continue writing into, you know, address a thousand and then beyond in one operation, okay? Otherwise, you know, you maybe have to write a little bit into here and then finish that and then write some into here and finish that one and then write into here and so on. That's, in my opinion, a very slight uh, concern of performance, as we'll see how I've written my loops and stuff like that. This should be a non-issue, but I'm, I'll certainly put it out there and say that there could be some sort of a, a concern there. Uh, and you could obviously reorder where your stuff goes in order to put things adjacent to each other. But you can only do so modulo all the alignment requirements due to the way the registers are set up. Blah, 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 blah. Let's just use this for starters. I've done some tests, and I can update an awful lot of stuff in real time on a per- uh, field basis here. In other words, I can redraw every character on this screen at 60 times a second, plus I can move around all the sprites and do a complete rewrite and refresh of the screen once for every single field update and get it all done just in the nick of time during that uh, 4,300 microseconds after the interrupt arrives and before it starts to draw the screen again up here. If you code very carefully, that's what you can do. It, it, it gets in just under the gun on a 10 megahertz Z80. But that only assumes that I'm updating some, but not all of these tables, all right? So that's, in my opinion, why we have all this configurable stuff and also why I could care less. We have memory to waste. We don't even use all the 16K. Just use what they have in the example and move on. So what happens? If you set everything up just like this, what you end up with is memory in the DRAM, whose addresses are from the, in, this in this diagram, from the perspective of the VDP, okay? Starting at address zero, the first thing you have is a table of things called sprite patterns. Then you have a table of things called a pattern table. These are both formatted identically, and they're even the same size. These are two different kinds of patterns. And as we'll see, what those are are the patterns of bits that represent a square 8x8 eight eight grid of pixels. Let me see if I can zoom in on one of these. We get a closer view here. Whoa, there we go. Um, for example, each one of these little white blocks, what this is, is the left four pixels of this eight pixel square block 
are all set to be white and the right four are black. Okay, here's another block up here. It's got some black on top, black on the left, and white for the rest of it, and so on. The same sort of a thing here with blue on blue, and then you've got your red on blue, and so on. Okay, so what happens is those uh, so called patterns, let me get this thing out of the way, are these 8x8 grids of dots which we use to, to, to create you know, what you could think of maybe as a, as a character in a font or at least a square 8x8 eight eight, uh, grid of pixels that represents a tile pattern maybe in a video game, okay? That's what goes up here. Sprite attributes. This table holds the position and some other information about where each one of the 32 sprites can be if they're turned on on your screen uh there's some unused data here there's this thing called a name table which every time i see it in print i'm like what the heck are they talking about i don't like the word name it drives me nuts but what this is it's a table that represents the tile number for each of the positions on the screen so what they call a name table Starts in the upper left corner. What tile goes here? They call that the name of the tile. And this one here, as it's programmed right now, I think the first one in the upper left corner is number zero. I honestly think we'll see in this program that what I did is put up here in the upper left is tile number zero, tile number one, tile number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on across these lines. And I think this is like the first whatever... Uh, uh, what is this, tw uh, 32 or 4? I don't remember how many characters per row this is, for crying out loud. I think it's 32 two tiles per row and 24 rows per screen. So I've got, in hex, two zero tiles on the first row, hexadecimal two zero tiles on the second row, another two zero in hex for this, and so on, right? That goes in this so-called name table. The names in this context refer to the tile numbers. The tile number represents a, a set of bits in the pattern table that is used to define the, the eight by eight grid of pixels that I can put in any of these tile locations on the screen, okay? Uh, what do we got? More unused stuff. Then there's this thing called a color table, and then there's an enormous amount of unused memory down here. Like I said, we got enough to waste. Now, one of the nice things about this is that, in theory, I could keep extra table information down here and tell the system that, like, for example, here's the name table right now, but... Uh, now leave these here and, and, and use this data down here as a name table later and so on. Now, uh, the only within certain reason you can do that. Some of the tables have to be on such a, a high uh, order boundary that, you know, if you try to move it, there's maybe only one or two places that it could go in the whole darn memory map anyway. But for those that can move, you can rearrange them, is my point. And you can use that, again, as a kind of performance uh, improvement if you want to have two copies of the name table and change which one you're using at any given point in time while your program runs. Okay? So I'm not going to get into any of that right now. We're using all the defaults. Let's just get a Hello World kind of program going. Now, what we're going to see in the source code of the M1T1 program, in the RAM of the actual program itself, we're going to have a bunch of constant data that's just part of our source code, or I'm going to just type in every byte value one at a time that represents all the data that goes in here. That's our initialization data. I'm going to replicate a copy of everything that belongs in this VRAM table and just copy it out there using my slow copy routine okay so now all we need to do is understand how all these tables work you believe it or not you already know how the pattern tables work it literally is eight bytes for each one of these tile patterns okay 
Each byte is eight bits that describe one row of pixels. And the only thing that you can do is you can define that a pixel is on or off. Each pixel has one single bit, can either be on or off. And what color it is when it's on and what color it is when it's off is given somewhere else in this color table down here. We have a very limited number of color possibilities and the color for all the pixels in one tile has to be the same. All the ons got to be one color, all the offs got to be the off color. And these tiles right here, every one of these is light blue when it's on, dark blue when it's off. These are all red when it's on, blue when it's off, green when it's on, blue when it's off, white when it's on, black when it's off. Down here, same thing, white on, black off. So you've got this combination of on-offs that you can express in these pattern tables. We're not going to do sprites today, so all we're going to really worry about is this table here, the name table, and the color table. So this is just going to be bits, eight bytes worth of bits for each one of those patterns, each tile that could be on the screen. This tells me which tile to put where on the screen. And I can put the same tile on the screen over and over and over again. That's what I've done here and down here. Okay. And down here is the so-called color table. And this table down here is when I, uh, where I put the, 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 the control codes of the, those four-bit values that say, you know, for these tiles, when there's a bit saying that it's on, use white. When it's off, use black, and so on, all right? So all we really need to do now is understand how these tables work. Now, they have a whole nice dial. Here's what, if you're going to use... You know, I don't know, graphic mode 2. Here's another way to configure it and so on. And there's another multicolor. I don't care about all these other modes. Today, we're only doing graphics mode 1. All the tiles are 8 by 8 And it gives you a nice picture. This is an 8 by 8 And you can put your on bits and your off bits. And they show you if you're going to do these patterns, here are the byte values. Oh, oh, one, oh, 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 was it 2, 0, and hex. So that's describing the 2, these left 4. And then the zero, or are these all offs? Simple as that. And you got eight bytes in a row. That's a tile. And then another eight bytes for the next tile, and so on. Okay, and it tells you, uh, here's what happens when you put eight bytes next to each other in memory. And all of them together is what we call pattern name number zero. And then later on, we get down here, and it talks about what happens in text mode and uh, optimization, don't care. And sprites have other kind of things and optimizations, how to make a smiley face, what happens when the sprites are blah, 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 blah. Doesn't matter to us right now. Graphics mode one. Let's now take a look at this so-called name table. We now know how to create... 8-bit values that have ons and offs, so to speak. Then we have this active display area. What goes where? Well, that's just a table. The first byte in the table says, well, what tile should go in here in the upper left corner? This is what they call a name of a pattern. So the first pattern is pattern number zero, if you fill it in like this, which is basically what I've done. I put tile zero in the first location, tile one, and so on. We'll see that source code in a minute. And I fill it all up. In decimal, what happens is they start on the upper left corner at zero, and it goes up and up and up and up, and the last one is 767. For a total of 768 names or IDs, I like to think of it, that represent which one of the tiles I need to put in what area. And I can put the same one over and over again. I can, you know, put different ones, whatever I want to do, okay? Uh, okay, so it talks more about the pattern table and more about the name table. And you know, this is pretty straightforward stuff, okay? Color table gets a little bit more interesting. The colors work according to 
I mean, this we got to realize, 40 years ago, we had a lot of limitations on our ability. <laughs> I mean, we were using composite video in the Americas, for crying out loud. That's very limited. Okay, so what does that mean to the color table? As they say, the color table for graphics no, mode one is 32 bytes long. So how do I describe colors for 768 different locations? Well, the answer is you don't. How many tile definitions are there? There's 256 different tile definitions, so-called patterns. Okay? Now, the colors are directly related to what they call these patterns. Colors have nothing to do with what's where on the screen here. All right, I just kind of threw that out as a little thing of reasoning and thinking and illustrating why we're having limitations here. What they're going to tell us here is that we have 32 different colors or color pairs, the foreground, background, color pairs in this table, period. And we have 256 unique patterns that go in the pattern table how do we know which color pair goes with each one of the patterns okay well in this table down here they say that the first byte in the color table is used to define the foreground and background colors for patterns numbers 0 through 7 so, as I said before, I just so happened to have put tiles, uh, pattern zero here, pattern one, pattern two, pattern three, four, five, six, seven, right here. And every one of these, in spite of the way it looks right now, I talked about this before, when you put too narrow of a graphic on an NTSC screen, you can confuse the color subcarrier and it can think it might need to be a color rather than being white and that's what's happening down here all this is white and black vertical bars yet you see no white you see no black <laughs> this is the problem when you have a single pixel wide vertical line in ntsc video and you're operating it with this high of a resolution okay the colors aren't going to come out right so either you do it and you live with it because, you know, that actually might be what you want. You couldn't even get this color out of the VDP. You cannot get that much resolution, and you can't specify the colors in this way. Only by mistake can you actually get this, which is kind of funny. But, you know, you could use that in a game if you really wanted to. Anyway, my point is, in spite of what you see right here, right now, these are the first eight patterns and I just happen to have put them in the first eight positions in the name table, okay? And the reason they're all white on black is because, as we'll see in the program, I, for, for, for color uh, byte number zero, I put white on black. The very second color in my color mode table, I put cyan on like dark blue or whatever this is. Okay, and that's why all eight of these are this way, not because of the position on the screen, but because I happen to put pattern numbers, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, right here on the screen. Over here, I put a bunch of pattern zeros. I put a bunch more pattern zeros in here, and we'll see in the code, my pattern zero has every pixel has a zero in it. It's like a space if it was a, you know, a font, okay? Then down here, I've got some more. I believe this is pattern uh, number uh, like 17 or hexadecimal 10, hexadecimal 11, and so on. And these eight patterns, because they're counting in order, will be color number two and uh, so on. This will be color number three because there's eight here, and we'll see in the code, that's what I put there. Down here, I put a bunch more zeros, then I put a bunch more, I don't know, whatever this is, like number four tiles down here. And because number four tile is part of the first eight, 
My color number zero is white on black. That's why these are all white on black. All right. Now that's all we really need to know right now. We're not going to use any of the other features of this. Let's just get this thing to come alive and become sane. So there's our loop. We just looked at it. So how do we configure this stuff? Well, here's my mode initialization. Where do I get all these values? How does this work? If we go back over to here, and we look at this table up here that says, here's graphics mode one, and I said, I don't care. I'll just use what they say. These bytes here, OOC005, blah, 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 uh, are OOC0580, right there, 012000, 012000, and uh, what do I got this 1F down here? I changed the backdrop uh, color. As you can see here, my backdrop is white. That's why this border around here is white instead of black. I did this so that I could see on my oscilloscope more clearly when I was painting the backdrop here, because white really stands out with the voltage shooting up on the scope. It's easier for me to see when I'm in the active display area and stuff like that, all right? So my I changed the, the, the background color from black to white, which is why this is F. Okay, so what's this other thing doing over here? If you look at the outer instruction, you go back to the previous video when I was showing you how to update and configure the registers and stuff like that. What you do is you put a value into the VDP, and then you send another byte to the VDP that has the most significant bit set, meaning I'm writing into a configuration register as opposed to the VRAM or something like that. And the register number is this hex digit over here on the right. So this says put 0 into register 0, put C0 into register 1, put 05 into register 2, and so on, which is exactly what they say to do right here. Okay? So uh, that's what's going on here. And the outer instruction just ripe, rapid fires all these out one after another in a simple tight loop, as opposed to what I did while I was debugging the board, and I did it all manually longhand. It's the only difference, okay? So I set it up the way they said, and now I'm going to create this data and memory that I told you I was going to do earlier, and that is I'm going to just fill it up, hard code it in the order that they say, oops, I scrolled the wrong way, to match this picture right here. Sprite pattern starting at zero, none of which I'm going to use. So here's the first region of memory for 800 bytes. I'm going to set all of them to F0. I can put anything in there. I purposely set them to F0 because if somehow these got used for something, it would be easy for me to recognize a graphic that's made out of a bunch of F0s. It would look like these white slugs right here. As we'll see, that is the, the pattern for these as well, okay? I decided to just pad it with that. Down here is the, the regular pattern table. Eight bytes for each one of those rectangular regions that can be placed into the active display area wherever I want under the control of the name table. So if the name table says put pattern number zero somewhere on the screen, it's drawing this. These are all zeros, which means it is blank. It means all the pixels are in the background color. And as I said before, the background color is defined. And that's why these are grouped by eights, by the way. The first color table entry represents the foreground and background color for these first eight patterns, no matter where I put them on the screen. So if I choose pattern 0 through 7, they're going to be white on black. And this is a kind of a, an, an image of what, uh, all the ons and offs. You look at the hex values in here. We got 0, 0, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, blah, blah, blah. What happens here matches what I've drawn over here, so to speak. What happens is this is the first row second row, third, fourth, fifth, and down to the bottom row for an 8 by 8 tile. And I remind myself that's what it's going to look like. One pixel on, followed by seven pixels off. Now that's for these rows here. That's a hex 80 is a one followed by all zeros. The top two rows of that 
square pattern are all going to be the background color. Now, if you look at the screen really closely, let me see if I zoom way in again. When I zoom in this much, this is crazy magnified, all right? This is being recorded off an of HD 4K monitor. This is like, <laughs> like 400% magnified over what you would normally see with composite video. And therefore, what happens is these blurred edges where the color is distorted is so enormously huge. You know, it, th this really exacerbates this distortion. So don't freak out and think everything looks horrible. Eh, compared to HD 4K, this is terrible. But in terms of composite video, this is okay, all right? I'm zoomed in a lot is my point. Now, this is the pattern for number one. It's this thing that has the wrong color in it because it's too narrow. It's too narrow because it has one pixel on followed by seven off. But that's what we're getting here. Two rows of blank background. That's why this is black up here. Followed by six rows where one pixel is on for each row. The next one, I've got two pixels on per row with uh, black on top. That is this one right here. It's closer to white. It's wider. It has less of a chance of being confused as a color. Even though if I look closely, there's a little bit of color in there. It looks a little bit purplish. The next one, I got what? Uh, three on and five off. This one's looking a little bit more like it's supposed to. I've got your black. you got your white. It's not confusing it as like this one over here, thinking it's a half of a wave of the carrier, this, uh, the chroma carrier, thinking it's supposed to be some sort of a colored dot. It is doing the right thing with, with white now and black and so on. So that's how you read all these things. So each one of these rows on this screen is one single tile definition. And if you look at what's happening in this code, these first eight are exactly the same in every way, shape, or form as the second eight is the same as these eight and so on. Okay. So that's a total of uh, 32 tiles, name uh, patterns is the name that they like to use, the word they like to use for each one of those things. So there's your 8, 16, 24, 32 patterns here. And I'm going to, this is each one of the patterns that we just looked at drawn across two different lines in the display area. Then this one down here are, you know, 32 copies of the same one. And this down here is, you know, like a hundred, 700 copies of another pattern. What is the copy? The, the bottom part of the screen is this down here. I pad this table out to its fully documented length of 800 in hex because this is how big it is. It goes from 800 to 1,000 in hex. That's 800 in hex bytes for this pattern table. So I need to make sure it's the full size so that the next thing starts where it's supposed to go and so on. That's why I padded it out. The padding value is 55. And in binary, it's a 10101, which is an unattainable goal at this resolution in NTSC, which is why the black, white, black, white, black, white, each one of the white pulses is being confused and interpreted as something that's supposed to have a color of some kind, which is why you have this giant, almost looks like a piece of candy or something, on the bottom part of the screen. Uh, if you don't want it to look that way, don't choose this pattern. I purposely chose it. That is the worst possible pattern you could put on a screen in NTSC. I just want to make sure we all understand what's going on. That's why I chose it for that. What comes after the pattern table is the sprite attribute table. And later on, we'll learn how sprites work. D0 is a magic value to put in the sprite table that indicates there's no sprite here. Don't try to draw one. That's followed by some unused uh, memory space. Again, we're down here. The uh, sprite attributes followed by unused right there. Next thing down there is the name table. And remember, the name table is the set of 
numbers that represents the pattern that goes in each one of the places on the screen. So this is why the first tile on the screen over here is number zero, because there's a zero right there. The second one is pattern number one, pattern number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. Then we see two rows of all zeros. This is tile number zero. And as we saw earlier, tile number zero is a blank. That's why it's blank in the upper left here. And these two rows of zeros represent all these blanks right here. These two rows of zeros represents all the blanks right there. And then we got 10, 11, 12, 13, up through 1F. Those represent all of these tiles right here. Then what do we got? We've got a whole bunch of zeros here. That's an entire row of zeros. The only reason they're blank, not because it's zero, but because I defined pattern number zero to have all pixels set to the background color. And the reason they're black is because, as we'll see in the color table, the color for the first eight patterns is white foreground over black background. That's why zero is all black right here. Okay. Now we got a whole bunch of threes, a whole bunch of other threes. That's this whole row of threes here, a whole bunch of threes right there. And this is what they look like because this is zero. This is pattern one, pattern two, and this right here is pattern three. So it, these are the same thing here as well as all these down there, okay? I pad out the rest of the name table with pattern number 20. And because I didn't specify a pattern number 20 up above in my pattern table, it's part of the padding here. And because the padding looks like this, that's why when I fill in all, I pad the entire name table with 20, that's why I get this giant candy stripe down here. That's the black, white, black, white, black, white. All right. So that's what's going on with that. As we saw before, we have some unused space in here to pad out. It doesn't matter what I put in there. That's this unused space. Then we have a color table. And I already told you how the color table works. The first color table entry says this is the um, foreground and background color for the first eight patterns. And as I explained, the first eight are going to be white on black. That's because color F is white and one is black. The second eight, pattern numbers uh, eight through F, are cyan on dark blue. And that's these here. There's cyan, dark blue. Doesn't look that dark to me. Again, we, eh, we got to take a closer look at the analog circuitry at some point on the board. But the colors are recognizable. Uh, re they're related to what they're supposed to be. Uh, good enough for now. Okay? I got red on dark blue. This is well known to me anyway as a really bad thing to do on ntsc putting re saturated red right next to a saturated blue we're mixing two saturated colors right next to each other are usually a recipe for ugh. so i did this one on purpose just to see what it looked like the red is not very red it does come out rather orangey but i'll tell you even though as bad as this look, again, we're zoomed in at you know, 400% magnification here. Uh, that looks not bad, all things considered. And we got green on dark blue, a bunch of white on black, white on black, white on black. This is why all of the other patterns are all set to white on black above. All the ones that fit into the padded region of all the otherwise unspecified patterns are all white on black, which is where we get this thing from down here, okay? That's why those are white on black. And this down here I use to calculate the length of the whole table. If you didn't pick up on this little ditty here while we were kind of glossing over it, well, the way this thing works is for each one of these tables, I know how big the table's supposed to be, and I don't always want to type it all in in its entirety because we'd be here a month. 
um, especially if I don't care about the whole thing. I only did a couple of test patterns. So I want a total of 400 bytes in this table, starting where I have a label VRAM init name right up here for the name table. I know it's totally supposed to be this big. I don't know how big it is because I just put some of the stuff in here. And I say, I want to define some space initialized to a hex two zero that fills up the amount of data between where I am minus here. Okay. However much is in here now, which is hex, uh, what is it? It's hex 10, hex 20, uh, hex 27. Uh, okay or hex 28 in terms of size, right? Here minus VRAM and it name is hex 28 bytes in size. So take 400 minus that for the remaining that I didn't specify and fill it all in with the 20s, all right? That's what this is doing. And those you'll see at the bottom of a lot of these otherwise partially filled in tables. If it's entirely not filled in, I just do this and hard code the whole thing, all right? And that's the whole program. That's it. I reserve some space for a stack so we can evaluate, we can evolve this program and um, make it do other things over the course of time. Compile this up along with a bunch of other test programs. You can definitely hide in there. There's the M1T1 uh, program. You go ahead and program up your, your, uh, your SD card. And the way I do this is like this. I do a make world. That'll clean everything, delete all the, you know, the file system. I've talked about this before. You make this font a little bit bigger, easier to see. And then it, this copies in a bunch of the standard files and standard programs into our uh, file system image, including the, all the CPM utilities in Adventure, because I always like to play around with Adventure. That's one of my thing that I like to do. Now... I don't automatically include everything under the sun into this thing. So as a second make command, you type make TMS 9118. And this will add all of the files in the directory we were just clowning around in. Your progs, TMS 9118, all the com files that were just built when I type make in here. Node 2, COM, all these test programs. Adds it to the file system. All right. And then you can type make burn or something like that. Yeah, make burn. If you're on a Raspberry Pi and you set it up the way I explained earlier, this is the command you want to do. I'm on my laptop or on my desktop system, rather, I should say today. And that's not the command that I use to burn my SD card. I have a completely different one. I'm not going to confuse you getting into the details. The short of it is it's just a different drive. If I did this on my desktop, I would have to use SDC1. And you need to make really sure you use the right one. I explained all this before. Otherwise, you could accidentally delete the disk that's holding your operating system or something. You need to know what you're doing. Keep your wits about you on this. I explained it before. Just do the right thing to get it copied onto your SD card. Now, once it's on the SD card, plug it into your retro board, hit reset, and boot it up. Now, when you reset your retro board, it's also going to reset the VDP, and it's going to leave you with a black screen like this. If you then run the M1 T1 test program, let's get this up here so we can see it, it should do this. If it didn't, then you probably have something set up wrong or whatever. And that's exactly what we'd expect to see, given the patterns and stuff like that that we put in our tables, all right? So that's all there is to it. Go ahead and play around this, create some new patterns, see what happens when you you know change the colors or you know <laughs> create a more thin vertical uh, one-pixel lines and things like that, and see what you can come up with. That looks good, what looks bad. Get the lay of the land so that when you're designing a game or something like that, you can do it in such a way where you don't end up with weird color artifacts you don't want part of your display. Now, if you're working ahead, I think I push this one up to the uh, repo as well. I'll do a video on this next time. This is a sprite demo. 
So while well, you're looking at something on the screen right now that actually looks kind of poor, and like I said, I did it on purpose just to make sure we all know what's going on. Here's one that doesn't look so bad. Now, if you do this and plug your joystick into joystick number zero, which is J4 on the schematic, and you plug in yourself an Atari joystick, and you move it around, you pull it down, you get this. Move it to the right, and those little arrows point in the direction that you're moving the joystick. So if I move up and to the right at the same time, it'll go up on a 45, same with left and you know, left, and then left and up, or just up, and so on. So if I move the joystick around and around like this, you can see this thing's all going. Now, if you work ahead and you look at this program, you're going to see a couple of things. There's a fast copy and a slow copy and uh, a, a wait routine that waits for the interrupt uh, signal to turn on to get all the timing just right. And this took a little bit of time for me to debug and get it all to work just right. But it's pretty important to get everything lined up if you're going to write a game and you want the thing to go pretty quickly. Now, as you can see, those little arrowheads, they don't all look perfectly green they're all supposed to be green on black there is a little bit of weird rainbowing going on but that gets us back into you know welcome to the 80s you know there's your ntsc color artifacts that you got to be a little bit careful about when you design your screen so anyway this is moving around and updating the screen 60 times a second redrawing the entire um name table by doing a full-blown memory copy from the Z80 memory every single time the frame is updated. Now, uh, granted, I put the same value in every one of the uh, entries on the in the name table for all 768 of them, but that's something that we can change. I just wanted to do a quick demo to make sure that I could figure out how to get sprites to go. That actually looked recognizable. And I think that I can take this, honestly, uh, uh, once we go through the details of the sprites and stuff like that, we should probably be able to figure out how to evolve this little program into a nice little breakout game with some, eh, maybe some funky uh, enhancements, like move the paddle up like this. If you play breakout, you know what breakout is. Go read the Wikipedia page. You got a bunch of bricks up here and a ball that's bouncing around, and you keep the ball in motion. And you have to hit the bricks in order to delete the bricks. And when you get all rid of all the bricks, you you finish a phase and then you start a new one and so on. And this width of the paddle and the speed of the ball moving is usually how the uh, skill level works. Let's go ahead and add another one. What happens? Now, normally when you play breakout, you're down here at the bottom of the screen. And you're moving back and forth like this to hit the ball as the ball comes back down. And all you're really doing is changing the speed of the ball and the width of your paddle. If you move the paddle up and play it up here, you're, that's a very difficult game to play. So maybe what we can do is, is implement one and then allow the user to move the paddle up like this. And if you play the game while you're up here, knocking down the bricks from up on the top like that, then maybe you get extra points or something like that. So we come up with a new variation. I don't know, just some thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comments below. We'll talk how this thing works next time. Now that we're finally in a, into a position where we can write some real code that recognizably does something that you might call a uh, video game sort of thing. So, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.